Good morning. Uh, today we're here to talk about how to prepare for and take a better deposition in trust and estates litigation. In order to do so, we need to understand the differences between trust and estates litigation with that from normal civil litigation. One of the most important differences is that our key star witness is often dead. Many witnesses in these types of cases are aged, infirm, maybe losing capacity, may have problems with recall and other memory issues. It is more likely in these types of cases that there will be a need to preserve testimony early on in the case or even before the case is filed. You will need to become familiar with California Code of Civil Procedure Section 2035, which provides for a mechanism of pre preserving testimony. Capacity and undue influence issues pervade the trust and estates litigation and are often at the center of the dispute. We need to become familiar with the issues of undue influence capacity. The place of the deposition may vary as well. It's not always in the attorney's office. In these types of cases, you may have to be visiting an assisted living facility, for example. You may go to an elder's home to make them feel more comfortable so they don't get nervous and they provide you with better recall and better testimony. If you need to preserve testimony, the procedure is set forth in 2035.010 at SEC in, and allows for the filing of a petition in order to preserve testimony of a witness who may not be available. This is important for elderly witnesses or those who are losing capacity. Those people may not be available for trial, and I can tell you from personal experience, in one case, we literally had three witnesses pass away during the course of the litigation. So it's important to make sure for the elderly witnesses that we are preserving their testimony by taking a deposition. In such proceedings for preserving testimony, you can file a petition, and it will allow for the testimony to be admissible in the court in another proceeding, even if the witness is unavailable or even deceased. It allows you to have the, the testimony preserved and offered into proof. However, it's very important to lay foundation because the caveat to the admissibility is really that of it's only admissible if it's admissible, so to speak. And what that means is that you need to lay your foundational facts of personal knowledge with these witnesses in the deposition. If not, it's not going to be admissible. There are several similarities with trust and probate litigation with civil litigation as well. And the most important is that under probate code section 1000, civil rules of procedure apply absent any specific statute in the probate code that provides otherwise or provides a specific procedure. Probate code section 1000 allows for the use of depositions under 2025 of the California Code of Civil Procedure and so all the rules in the 2025 at SEC sections would apply in not only civil litigation cases, but trust and probate litigation cases. The types of cases you will come across will involve will contests, trust contests, and other such contests involving lack of capacity, undue influence, fraud, and other things. So you need to become familiar with those types of issues. Construction of instruments are also common in these types of cases. We also more specifically need to know the key players in these cases. Remember the testator or the settlor is often dead. That makes these other witnesses much more important in your case in a trust and probate litigation matter. Members of the family of the decedent, including surviving spouse, are important. Prior caretakers of the decedent, friends, neighbors of the decedent, professionals such as treating physicians, drafting attorneys, the person who drafted the estate plan for the decedent, Witnesses and notaries shouldn't be overlooked as there's often fertile ground to obtain good facts for your case when deposing a witness or a notary who validated a particular instrument or was present for the signing. CPAs, bookkeepers, accountants, investment advisors, and attorneys who advise on other non-estate planning issues are also important. And then finally, what we have are what we call the interlopers. The interlopers are the people who show up often after the death of a spouse or a loved one, and work their way into the elder's life. And this results in often claims for undue influence, elder abuse under the Welfare and Institutions Code, and other types of claims of fraud. In preparing for our deposition, we need to understand and set forth our own goals of what we want to acquire in the deposition. The first, of course, is the most obvious, is informational gathering. 
you want to set forth what do you need to prove your case and then seek that information from the witness. For example, under probate code section 811, there's a number of factors to consider as to how they relate to a party's capacity. Know those factors and then be able to question on those factors. And in doing so, make sure you also ask for the other side of the story. This is your opportunity to find out what good facts the other side plans on using against you. It is a common mistake for inexperienced attorneys to only focus on their side of the case and not look for information from the other side. What we want to know is what is all out there, and then we argue the facts that are out there. Another goal is to obtain admissions from a witness and, or even a party. If we obtain the admissions, we can resolve factual disputes and save a lot of time. It could also lead to the setting up of dispositive motions, which we'll get to. We talked about preserving testimony. It is important in these cases because of the likelihood of death, the loss of memories. A lot of these events happen long ago. The more time that passes, the more recall is lost. We want to test our theories and our, test our lines of questioning and deposition to see if it works. We don't want to be caught off guard at trial on something that doesn't work. Here's your time to experiment. You can also attack the credibility of witnesses, although that often may be a secondary plan, particularly with the new seven-hour limitation on a deposition. Facilitating settlement is also a goal. 99.9% .9 of the cases settle goes the same. Well, if that's the case, then we shouldn't be holding back all the time. And in many cases, it's proper to show the other side their weaknesses through the witness in a deposition to show that their case won't hold up under scrutiny or they don't have the facts to prove their case. That can facilitate settlement, which is a goal of depositions. And interim relief, such as the suspension of a trustee, a bad trustee, we get facts and we bring a motion to suspend the trustee, appoint a new interim trustee pending the outcome of the hearing. Another issue would be the dispositive motions, summary adjudication of issues. Let's get rid of the issues that are not contested anymore by obtaining the right information. Set up finalization of one issue adverse to the other side. In preparing for the deposition, you really need to focus on the documents. These depositions on these cases are document intensive. Some of the documents that you're going to need to know and trust in estate litigation and really study include the current estate plan, former estate plan, so there's comparisons. We see the progression of gifting, changes of fiduciary, changes of thought processes of the set law. We need to study the deeds, powers of attorney. We need to look at the medical records in cases of capacity and undue influence. We need to look at the financial records to make sure everything's being accounted for. So know your documents. These are document intensive cases. We also need to know what facts do you need for your case. Line out, I need to prove A, B, and C, and then look what facts do I need to prove each of those. What does the other party need to prove? Does the witness even have knowledge of these facts? It's often common in undue influence cases where they're simply referring ref, or relating a story that someone else told that they heard. They really don't know. They have no personal knowledge. Then prepare your outline for questioning. At the deposition, then, you have something to follow. And when you start the deposition, use the admonitions to your advantage by getting promises or commitments from your witness that this is today, in the deposition, the best testimony they will ever have. They won't come up with a new story at trial or at a later date. General questioning techniques include the funnel approach, where you start with the broad up at the top of the funnel and work yourself down to the narrow at the bottom of the funnel. The top is the open-ended questions, who, what, where, why. You then follow up with more detail. Describe what happened. What do you mean by that? And then what we do is we do what we call exhaustion. We close things up. Is there anything else you might know about that? Those are the types of questions that close the door to them trying to remember something else later. And then you fill the gaps, and then you can summarize their testimony. Finally. In this type of litigation, there's often high emotion running, which means you might run into some just plain jerks as counsel. It happens. Civility guidelines of the State Bar of California are a good tool to preempt that. Ask for a stipulation. If you don't get a stipulation that both sides follow civility guidelines, ask again at the deposition and attach it as Exhibit A. It makes great exhibits in persuasive authority for the judge to present to the judge should a motion be necessary. If that doesn't work, you're left with appointment of referee to, proceed, uh, to control the proceeding under CCP section 639. Uh, under California rules of court, though, however, those are only for exceptional circumstances, so referees are not a common use uh, in depositions. So when 
taking a deposition, remember that it really starts with knowing your case, knowing the law, knowing what you need to prove your case, and then go getting that information. And I want to thank you very much and hope this has been helpful for you and will help you in your practice. Thank you.